Um, it's it's uh, my honor to, uh, to present uh, our speaker for today. Uh, I, I called him a little while ago and he has had a bad cold and overslept this morning and as we all do occasionally, uh, lost it. Okay. So uh, he has very impressive credentials and uh, the title of this talk, as you probably know, is uh, Ending the Euthanasia and uh, What Science and Faith Say About Saving America's Future Generations. Uh, he's uh, telling us that the United States children, youth, and adults have the worst rate of mental, emotional, and behavioral related disorders among rich democracies. Now that's a disgrace and uh, it's something that he's been working on quite a bit. I'm going to cut this a little shorter because of the time, but uh, he's worked with uh, other nations, he's worked with uh, universities, he's worked with uh, state health departments, with uh, facilities like uh, the police, uh, and even uh, he's had uh, experiences with uh, some of the uh, things like, uh, what's that? Okay. Yes. Okay. Sesame Street, Pentagon, and whatever. Too many things. I was going to make uh, this a little mention of more things, but since we are running behind time, I'd like to present to you Dr. Ennis, Ennis Embry. Yeah. science to change the world. I also come to you uh, in a sort of paradox. Um, I'm a gay man. My husband and I have been together for 23 years. I taught Sunday school for 12 years. Got my foster daughter out of Sunday school. Uh, as a gay man, uh, and a conscientious objector, and a contributor to liberal democratic uh, causes, I was GS-15 for uh, Secretary Cheney when he was the Secretary of Defense. I was on special assignment for the Pentagon to go to Germany to investigate why so many children in the United States uh, who were the dependents of U.S. service people deployed in the Gulf War, why they had so many mental health symptoms within uh, 30 days. Forty percent of the children affected by the deployment in Germany developed mental health symptoms of uh, traumatic experiences, regression, etc. And it was during that event in Munich that the reason for this came to me because before that I had this sort of insight. People were saying, oh well all these kids have, you know, they develop mental illness. And I said, how the hell do 40 percent of the children develop a mental illness in 30 days? It cannot be a mental illness. So I went, this, does anybody here know what the, has ever looked at the DSM-4, like the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychiatric Disorder? Well, go online and look at it, okay. You, you won't, unlike when you read, you know, normal things in, you know, about uh, illnesses, you don't normally want to claim one of those. People kind of like, I don't think I don't want to have So. As I looked at the symptoms for post-traumatic stress reactions and other childhood-related disorders, uh, I realized that virtually every single one of those illnesses, and I put it in quote marks, had evolutionary significance and benefits when the world went crazy. Now, let me pose a question to you this morning. What, who or what is the principal predator of humans since the invention of stone tools? Other humans. Other humans. And since the invention of stone tools, and humans being the predators of humans, who became the principal source of safety for humans? 
other humans. So this is the distinction between friend and foe. So the prefrontal cortex, upon the invention of stone tools, radically accelerated prefrontal cortex. Why? Because you have to keep in mind who's friends and who's foes. Because if you were alone in the world, humans just don't survive very well. In anthropological societies and hunting and gathering economies, you are not capable as an adult male of fully surviving on your own until about age 30. And you can't do it for a long time. What if you break bones? What if you get sick? All of those things we depend on. Now, that made me realize that we were enacting that primordial, ancient evolutionary mechanism in children. So, for example, the psychiatrists and the social workers and the school counselors were saying, the children are having aggression because they, they want to find sleep right next to their mommies. So if you were my mommy and I thought the world was dangerous and my daddy was going to get killed, where would I want to sleep? Next to me. They went right next to me because the world is filled with a lot of foes. And I need the one person on the entire planet that would probably die to protect mom. So now notice, however, that the children in Germany were not in any way, shape, or form threatened by the foes in the desert sands. Their perception of danger came about watching AFN, Armed Forces Network, and hearing all of the adults talk about this. Now, to give you an idea of how significant the deployment was on the dependent adults left in Germany, 100,000 people left in December to go God knows where. I was not privy to that. I mean, they went there somewhere. But the sales of alcohol in the post exchanges in January was the same as December. when there were 100,000 more people. That was a very interesting thing. So to give you an example of how adults make these things a little light, is so I'm in an elementary school in a German installation, in a US base. And the schools are completely surrounded by guns, machine guns, anti-aircraft tank, all sorts of crap that are there. Sandbags are about this high around all the school. And you know, you drive on the base, or it's like checking underneath your car with the mirrors and things like this. So a little girl goes up to the teacher, fourth grade teacher, and she says, Teacher, are you afraid of terrorists? Now everybody's been told to reassure the children. So she says, oh no, I'm not afraid of terrorists at all. What do you think the fourth grade teacher, the fourth grader, thinks? She's full of <laughs> horse fighting. Because all of those guns and weapons, and every like 10 or 15 minutes, there's an ad on AFN saying, beware of terrorists. Look under your car. Check the bags and the buses. So the little girl interpreted, it must be a lot worse than what I thought it was. So she's trembling, that little girl. Okay. Now what the teacher is a proxy for mom, a proxy for the group, the clan. She has responsibility. She is an owl parent. Animal parent means other who has parental duties and responsibilities for raising the children of the tribe of the people. 
Now, humans are the only significant species that does owl parenting without having any genetic connection. So you as the fourth grade teacher, I mean, you could have been born on Mars, but I'm going to cuddle up to you as that fourth grade child for protection and safety. By the way, what she should have said is, of course, honey, we're afraid of the terrorists. That's why all of these soldiers are here protecting us, and that's why they have all of these announcements to make sure that we're safe. Have any terrorists attacked us? No. But what sort of a job do you think they're doing protecting us? They're making us safe. Okay. So these are daily evolutionary interactions. And I illustrate this one because it has, you know, it's like a black and white picture. Now, we live in a world that's very different for our children. Let me ask you this question. How many of you know a middle class, working class, or upper class family that's reasonably intact? Okay. Reasonably intact. You know, there's no old family that's perfect. You know, lots of novels have been written about the pursuit of the perfect family. As well as the not so perfect ones. But imagine you think of all your friendship networks. The intact or reasonably intact, okay, working class, middle class, or upper class family that has a child, a teen, or an adult child with a mental, emotional, or behavioral disorder besides me. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you know. Okay. Now normally in America, about every person raises their hand. Now think back. I see a lot of gray hair. I'm fortunate, I'm 65, but I don't have much gray hair. But, Think back to our childhood, to our senior high school years. Almost none of us in this room would have had a classmate in our senior high commit suicide. But today, when I talk to high school kids, every high school class has a several kids committed suicide. And you can't fake that. You're either alive or dead. It can't be a liberal, progressive, communist conspiracy. <laughs> Nor a right conspiracy. It is a fact. So hold that. But now if I ask the same question in Commonwealth countries, <coughs> Canada, Australia, New Zealand, where I used to live. Only one half of the people will raise their hands to that question. Now, if I ask that question for the people who live in the northern European countries, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, or the lowland European countries, Belgium, Netherlands, only about one quarter of the people will raise their hands to that question. Now that's reflecting what we actually know about the epidemiology of these problems. We are not living on that river in Egypt. It's a fact. Okay? More children have mental, emotional, behavioral disorders by prevalence rate in the United States than virtually any industrialized, rich democracies of the world. And our rates of mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders have been objectively, clearly, and cleanly rising for the last 20 years, and probably 50 years. It's fine. All of that is largely the result of what's called evolutionary mismatch, in which the ancestral environments to which we evolved and were adjusted to, 
So I typically look for all of the adults and the peers in my clan or group of people to protect and support me. That's not true now. That's not true now. What do you hear about all the time that kids are doing to one another? Bullying. Okay, okay. Now, the bullying today is nothing like what happened to any of us when we were kids. It's persistent and constant. That means that the kids no longer have and the peers no longer have the sort of social things that would control and manage. You know, I had one of my play. How many of you ever uh, were playing with your friends and one of your friends got obnoxious and you told him, and the group told him that they, he couldn't play or she couldn't play with the group for a while? Did anybody remember that? Yeah. Okay, that's the kind of natural things that kids do when somebody gets out of black. But children don't play outside anymore, do they? Where are they? <laughs> so that's for two reasons. Now, do middle-class children and upper-class children play outside more than poor kids? Yes. Why is it that poor kids don't play outside? It's not safe. It's, quote, not safe. Now, um, when I was growing up, and I was a little kid, I lived most of it with my grandma, and my grandma would say, you have to cross the street and ask a... Adult. No. A stranger. No, no. Don't speak to strangers. But, Midwestern, if you needed help, and you had to ask an adult, that adult would likely be a... Stranger. So that's another example of what this principle is of our parenting. Other people taking care of other people's kids who have no genetic involvement. And other children helping take care of other children, principally across age groups. Our children today do only play in same age groups. If they play, most of the time it's with this. And this stuff has no social prefrontal cortex to go too, too much too far. So those are some of the things that are working. Now, why is it that those other countries have less of the prevalence rates, or at least the voted prevalence rates, than we do? We pay for all the prevention science and biological and social sciences that has allowed us to have these core understandings. But we do not use the science. Guess who uses the science? Those other countries. So presently, I'm a co-investigator at Johns Hopkins and have been affiliated with Johns Hopkins since uh, about 2002. And at Johns Hopkins, we're running some of the most extensive um, and successful prevention studies in the world to prevent mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders, which I will tell you more about. Now, those are elegantly controlled studies where we've randomized first grade children to get something or not get something, and we've followed them now for 25 years subsequently. The intervention is ridiculously inexpensive. The research to follow kids for 25 years that employs an army of graduate students. And we're on the phone all the time. Now, we have multiple iterations and implementations of that same strategy funded by the United States federal government to 38 communities, which is a wonderful thing to for the government, and they're expanding this a little bit. However, the province of Manitoba which is 1.3 million people, just a little bit larger than Pima County, is doing the intervention that we did at Hopkins for first graders for every single first grader in the province. And we are tracking 
the results, and I'll show you more of those results. In Belgium and the Netherlands, they're doing widespread implementation of population, and in the UK, doing population-based parenting supports. So any parent can get supports. I mean, how, how many of you had your own kids? Okay. Or have kids that, I call them children of choice. Those are kids that don't have any biological affiliation, but you kind of adopted them and have nurtured them. Did anybody besides me have any of those? Okay. So, in the UK and Belgium and the Netherlands and a couple of, and in Sweden, uh, they're all the time, if you want to know, I can't, my kid will not poop in the potty, or my kid will not pick up their toys, and, it's, and they're having temper tantrums, and just driving me crazy. Here you got to go say, you know, you go see the doctor, and the doctor's going to say, either it's a phase, or take these little pills. <laughs> okay? Now, both of them are the wrong solution. If there are any doctors in the house, a family practice or pediatrics person only gets, uh, if, if they take, the, if the pediatric person only gets eight weeks of child development. I'm a child development psychologist, and it took me seven years to get my PhD. You think you'd learn a little bit more in seven years versus eight weeks? Yeah. So we have, it's a phase, or it's pills. Well, in these other countries, you can turn into TV shows that show practical advice. In the United Kingdom, they ran a TV show called Driving Mom and Dad Mad, not like Nanny 911, but the parents were the heroes and they had really awful children. I mean, you know, you don't need to send them back to their neighbor, but you can't do that legally or morally. Um, so people, that show ran against desperate housewives. It outdrew desperate housewives. And the study that was done, it couldn't be done as a randomized control group study. It had to do as a carefully done case control study, which they were able to do. That showed that the people who had the children with the worst problems were the people who watched the show. And if we had to train professionals to go out and provide the same kind of brief advice type of thing, we would have had to have trained 11,000 practitioners in the United Kingdom to deliver those same services. Do you know how much that TV show costs to produce? $200,000. Now, we have a problem right now in Arizona, don't we? We do have a Jerusalem bit of a problem. And I'm going to tell you, there is no flipping way that you can solve the child maltreatment problem by investigating. Good luck with that. You need medication. Here's one. Does anyone here think that the substantiated cases of maltreatment that the state of Arizona shows we have, or any state for that matter, are the actual rates of maltreatment. Now, we all know that that's, um, is this on? Yeah, it is. But it doesn't seem, I don't hear it very loudly. Is it, can you all, is it coming on? Yeah. yeah. Right. So, not for you. <laughs> it is. It's right up here by the uh, thing. So unless they can turn it up a little bit. Because I'm speaking fairly loudly myself without straining my whole voice. So if they can turn it up a little bit, that would be great. So some colleagues of mine did a study to estimate the underestimate of child maltreatment. That's a tricky problem. So they had 186 counties, I'm sorry, 185 counties in two states. You need a large sampling to do this properly. Oh, that one? We'll try that and see. Yeah, I, I can do that a little bit. Okay. So they did an estimate of the underestimate. They did random digit telephone calling. 
in each of the counties, and then they interviewed people if they had a child who lived in the house. On the phone, they did the clinical interview for suspected physical maltreatment, neglect, and child sexual abuse. Now, this is a telephone interview, but the same interview that they would give parents or caregivers in the clinical setting. Then they correlated the responses to that with the official, quote, the official substantiated reports on child maltreatment for both sexual and neglect and uh, physical. So what they discovered was that the underestimate, if a county had 100 cases of physical abuse, correlating that with the random digit telephone calls, that there would have been 40 times the rate of substantiated child maltreatment. That'd be 4,000 instances. And the multiplier for neglect was 15. The multiplier for child sexual abuse was 10. Not 10%, 10 times. So for those of you who have anybody here a license clinician, so, in a group of clinicians, I ask, uh, what percentage of the people show up to your practice uh, for mental health treatment to uh, have adverse childhood experiences? Go, Almost all. Almost all. There's exceptions. Car crashes, murders, and traumas, horrible, evil employers, things like that. So, that's why my colleagues, and I got to be an advisor on that test, did a population level trial to provide universal access to parenting supports. So you know when most child maltreatment happens? During what are called compliance episodes. Pick up your toys, get ready for school, get ready for bed. Do your chores. Take the dog out. Stop fighting with your brother and sister. That's when it happens. Now, we know that because my ex and I used to uh, do direct home observations of uh, people who had open cases of child maltreatment. And we were able to observe that within uh, on home visits, that such open cases. Uh, physically, emotionally uh, abused their children on the order of 10, I'm sorry, 2 to 10 times an hour. In front of us, push, shove, pinch, yelling in their ear. So, generally around compliance episodes. So, the TV show and this, then this study that funded by the CDC provided practical parenting tips on solving those problems. How to get your kid to go to bed, how to get them to do their homework, how to get them to play with their siblings or whatever. And we trained 1,100 practitioners in the two state, or in the uh, nine counties that got a uh, program versus the nine counties that were controlled, randomized and matched. We have baseline data on uh, substantiated child maltreatment, federally reported. Uh, baseline data on out-of-home placements for child neglect or abuse, etc. And child medical injuries at hospital uh, uh, caused by child maltreatment. Within, after training 1,100 people, for which we never asked permission to train the practitioners in the community, we just went and did it. They had two or three days of training. They learned how to do these things. They got the materials. We turned on a publicity machine, uh, being able to get these things. We weren't able to turn on a TV program because it would be contaminated across counties. But with that intervention alone, we were able to reduce the indicators, the officially federally reported indicators of child maltreatment by a factor of almost 25%. Do you know how much that costs to do? $12 per child. Now, most states actually settled a lot of lawsuits for those cases, those bad cases I know in Florida because we didn't work with that. 
in much digging in the governor's office, we found out they were spending somewhere around 25 to 30 million dollars a year to settle lawsuits against children who were either killed or seriously made or injured. My question to the governor's office is, where is that in the budget line of the state government? Where is that 25 to 30 million dollars? Because we should be tapping into it. The strategy I just defined, described to you for the entire state of Florida, which is one of the largest states in the union, would cost $14 million a year. And I'll show you the savings. So what I tell you is we have a hell of a problem, but there are practical solutions that we have the research in this country to do. And other countries are doing it. And that is placing us at serious economic, political, and security disadvantage compared to the other rich industrial democracies. So we have a, this is a little war conference. We've got four million young people who start first grade every year. Who teaches those children? Underpaid teachers. A teacher is an owl parent. Do you, does anyone believe that a parent has complete, absolute, deterministic control over the well-being, faith of their children? No. If you do, please see me outside later for vacation. <laughs> what happens in first grade? will determine the well-being of your child or grandchild. Not perfectly, but will have substantial impact on your child's entire life. 123,000 of those boys in that first grade cohort will commit a serious violent crime by age 21. Does anyone here think that that is a fixed number? No, but that's kind of what happens right now, but I'll show you we can actually cut that number substantially just by changing something in first grade. Oops. 783,000 of those boys will have a serious drug addiction by age 21. That's a large number of kids, ladies and gentlemen. Did anyone notice the uh, story in the Arizona Daily Star that most of the cases of child maltreatment have to do with what? Drugs. Drugs. Time is a waste. 391,000 of those boys will have a tobacco addiction by age 21. Does that have any impact on health care costs? Each one of those is going to cost another half a million dollars. Just from that. Okay. By the way, all of these things are related. 412,000 of the boys will have alcohol addictions by age 21. Is there any correlation between Violent crime and domestic violence and alcohol abuse. Yep, yeah, just a wee bit. I can describe all the neuropeptides that are altered by alcohol, and it ain't good, especially for people who have very different uh, genetic backgrounds. Okay, 865,000 of those boys out of the four, that's 4, 000, uh, 4 million kids altogether, boys and girls will require special services by age 21. Has anyone noticed that the need for special education has been going up substantially in America? Presently, in most school districts in the United States, the special education services now take up about a quarter to one third of the general budget. 
And everyone thinks, well, the Feds reimburse that. No, ladies and gentlemen, they don't. Fed gives about 10 cents on the dollar. That's a hell of a way to run a business. Three hundred and seventy-five thousand of the girls will have suicidal ideation by age twenty-one. Is there a relationship between women who killed their children and suicidality? Yes, there is. Four hundred and ninety-four thousand of the boys will have suicidal ideation by age twenty-one. Has anyone noticed that? That it's getting bigger? Let me give you a little frame of reference. I'm in a group here who will remember this. Does anybody remember the polio epidemic besides me? Yes. Okay. Yes. I got my shot at Osborne Elementary School in Phoenix, Arizona, where, by the way, I also have the dubious honor of being labeled as uh, educational, uh, educationally mentally retarded. I love that. Partly because I have genetic mosaicisms for Down syndrome, seeing an increase across my palm, only about 1% of the folks. You see my first grade young pictures, you'll see a pointed ear much more than it is as an adult. And uh, that's another genetic mosaicism. I was born one month premature, and I was rather obdurate. I didn't want to take the test. So I didn't. And the psychologist classified me as educated and mentally retarded. That's a long story. So, at the height of the polio epidemic in 1952, 3,000 people died in America, and 60,000 people were infected. How panicked were American families during that time period? Okay. Does anybody remember what you were told you couldn't do? Swim. You couldn't swim. <coughs> couldn't have parties. All those kinds of things. Some places were put on quarantine. So 3,000 people died. 60,000 people were infected. Now, who got the shots when they came out? After, they, you know, there's a big test of them that's called the Thomas Francis test of the salt vaccine. 1.8 million people were tested. After that was proven, who got the shot? Everybody, all the kids got a shot. No exception. I remember in Osborne people get kids screaming and parents pushing and shoving and oh, it was horrible. Okay. Now take those suicide numbers. Last year, thirty-eight thousand people killed themselves, including five thousand people. Seven hundred and eight thousand. People showed up in emergency rooms on the downstairs. For self-inflicted injuries, excluding drug overdoses and single car crashes. That's ten times those numbers. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Didn't take into account drug overdoses. Didn't take into account single car crashes that were, you know, can't tell if they were delivered or not, but oftentimes they were. Doesn't take into account all the other morbidities and more, uh, of this phenomenon. Now, 400,000 of those children will have serious uh, adverse childhood experiences, including physical maltreatment that have lasting health effects. So in Arizona, we have 71,000 first graders, 2,177 uh, 2, will commit serious violent crimes. That was repeat, sorry. 13,700 of the boys will have serious drug addictions by age 21. 6,800 will have tobacco addiction. 7,200 will have an alcohol addiction. 15,000 of the boys will require special education services by age 21. 6,600 will have uh, girls will have suicidal ideation. 8,700 boys will have suicidal ideation. 
By the way, almost all of these very serious violent crimes that we see, multi uh, mass murders, all involve suicidal ideation by boys. And about 70,000 children will have serious things. Now, if you had $200 per first grader to protect, what would we do? It's amazing when people say, oh, we have more school counselors, social workers, and other kinds of things like that. I'm not after that. You cannot treat your way out of a problem. You have to prevent it. So the analogy for those of us who experience the polio epidemic, we said, well, we need more iron lungs. We need more braces and occupational therapists to help people recover from the uh, deal with their paralysis for their lives. Uh -huh. No, we needed the Salk vaccine. <coughs> then we got the Sabine vaccine because that was on a sugar cube and could be used worldwide. It wasn't as effective as the injectable one, but it was more transportable. And the country mobilized to provide the polio vaccine first the salt, then the city. By 1963, uh, there were only 168 cases of polio in the entirety of the United States. And by 1991, thanks to the Rotary Club International, the very last indigenous polio case happened in the Western Hemisphere in Pedro. I tell you this story because we have a science and technology that is as good or better than the salt vaccine and the Thomas Francis uh, major experiment to eradicate, if not substantially reduce, and protect our children from lifetime mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders. The costs are minimal. So, uh, what would happen if we did a fourth grade uh, first grade intervention that was developed by a teacher in fourth grade? It's in the Institute of Medicine report. By the way, every single piece of science that I'm talking about, you can look up in pubmed.gov. That is the National Library of Medicine. Found, uh, created years and years ago. The IOM was created in 1863 by Act of Congress along with the National Academy of Sciences. So again, the web address for the science is www.pubmed.gov. Pubmed.gov. We now have the largest library of peer-reviewed publications on medical and psychological and behavioral sciences and epidemiology available to anyone in the world who can read, who has access to the internet. Okay? So, now if we went into every first grade and we taught children the miracle of being able to do self-regulation in pure context. So when children arrive to first grade, they don't know how to read particularly well, except maybe their names. They don't know how to write particularly well, except their names and maybe their addresses or phone number. And they don't know how to do math, except basic counting, which all humans are innately endowed with to do counting. But they don't know how to do mathematical operations. Barring accidents of fate, every child will leave first grade having better skills to read, write, and do arithmetic. But the core thing, this, the fourth miracle, is the ability for voluntary control over attention, for intention in pure context. That is the secret of human development. And our school teachers don't learn how to do don't know how to do that. And doing discipline doesn't do that. If I do consequences for your bad behavior, that typically increases defiance on the part of the children, either overtly or covertly. So self discipline, self monitoring is a skill that has to be carefully um, inculcated, and it used to happen as a natural course of children's play, chores in the community, and all of the cooperative experiences that we had, which have now essentially evaporated in modern life. So, we can teach that, though. 
So if we did that from our Hopkins study, 39,000 fewer children would grow up to commit violent crimes. And in Arizona, 697 would grow up fewer to grow up to commit violent crimes. Now that doesn't sound like very money, very much, but multiply that times two to five million dollars is the cost of an individual who has lifetime violent crime. That's not just the cost of their incarceration, it's all the damage they do. They, oh, do they make a few babies? <laughs> no, that's, that's another conversation in evolution. Okay. But we can't afford to act. You know, we're poor and we're budget, you know, and we can barely scrape our pennies together. But what about return on investment? Okay. The return on investment for first grade, oh, sorry, it says Connecticut. I uh, didn't change that title up there, but it's, the number is correct here. Um, the return on investment would be $18.2 billion by age 21 in the United States per first grade cohort. $332 million for the entire state of Arizona by age 21. And if, this t if a teacher, is anybody here in this room a teacher? Okay, so if you use was this strategy just for one year, Return on investment is 30 to 1. But if you used it, you know, like if you learn how to do something really good, you tend to repeat it. And if you used it for more years, the return on investment gets to be more, as much as 50 to 70 to 1. That's independently evaluated. Now, everybody says, oh, we have so much to do. We have the common core. We have all, oh, oh, the new curriculum. And they keep changing superintendents like daily in TUSD. <laughs> There's just not enough time. Ah! By the way, teachers, I have a terrible time with depression because of all of this. Terrible thing. So, but when you do this strategy of teaching self-regulation, you gain the functional equivalent of 15 to 26 uh, more days for effective teaching and learning. If you had to buy those days, additional school days, which the, every now and then the legislature talks, well, we'll make school longer. Well, if you make school longer and the classroom days are crazy, you just expose everyone to more craziness. Uh, and it increases academic achievement by 0.2 to 0.44 standard deviations just by that alone. Now, this first grade intervention actually eliminates the need for office referrals. That saves time, for those of you who have done that. Decreases all service needs. For mental health service, special ed by about 40%. Improves the efficiency of special education services so higher intensity strategies are not needed. You don't have to go to those awful IEP meetings. I've been to hundreds of those, and you have about 15 to 20 people in the room we're there for about three hours and argue like cats and dogs, and they sign a big piece of paper, and the entire function of that paper is to put across your rear end. That's a shame, because it should be. And intention. Now, but here's the, here's the gig if you teach this voluntary control, where peers are cooperating to create a peaceful climate, a positive, pure, peaceful climate in their classroom. They're the heroes of the change. Nationally, this would translate into 350,000 fewer young people needing special education services. 226,000 more boys would graduate from high school. Oh, that's on the mayor's list. More kids graduate from high school in Tucson, Pima County. Uh, 272,000 more boys would likely enter university. 361,000 girls would graduate from high school. 282,000 uh, more girls would enter university. Now people ask me, why is it that the girls would be more likely to graduate from high school than boys? Yeah, who said it? The grades. You know, that's a complication. Boys just do a little, you know, 30 second thing. It was fun, but the consequence lasts for the girl. So they drop out of school. We have a special classroom. Yeah, I've been to the So, and then 391,000 fewer boys would develop serious drug addictions, 267,000 fewer young people would become regular smokers, 144,000 fewer young people would develop serious addictions, 197,000 fewer young women would contemplate suicide, and 267,000 
a young man would contemplate suicide. Here's the results for Arizona. 6,100 fewer boys, uh, young people would need special education services. 391,000 more boys would graduate. Uh, 3,900 would more likely graduate from high school. I'd just let you read these. Now we know these, we can calculate these figures because their work at Hopkins was basically a modified population level strategy across first grades. And then these have been computed based on the long-term follow-up. You know, it could be more or less in certain states, depending on the baseline rates of behaviors. But this is a projection. It's nice to have a projection. You know, your investments may vary, like the things. OK. But what about the lifetime cost of the violent behavior reduced? So in the US, that would be 79 to $197 billion per first grade cohort. In the state of Arizona, that would be $1.3 to $3.4 billion. And that would sure knock a hole in the uh, prison industrial complex that our state is trying to pass. But it can't happen in time. Just don't have enough time. That's going to take 20 years to show the results. Yes. We have the science to make change rapidly. Now, I'm showing you a long-term one, but we also have things that work now, quickly. This is Anna Marquez Green. Her dad was a professor at the University of Manitoba, where I'm also a scientific uh, colleague. And we launched, in November of 2010, I met with Cabinet for 90 minutes. I have never met with an American state cabinet for 90 minutes. Never. Made this similar presentation that couched for Winnipeg and Manitoba specifically with the numbers in the newspaper headlines. We finish. The minister who's in charge, the uh, chair of the cabinet, Mr. Rondeau, turns and looks at all the members of the cabinet and they're all going, Mr. Rondeau says, uh, Dr. Emery, we'd like to thank you for your presentation. It seems to be the consensus of the cabinet that we would like to proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rondeau and members of the cabinet. Then he says, and Dr. Henry, how soon could you make this happen? And I said, Mr. Rondo, members of the cabinet, how soon can you write a check? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back to you on that. That was November, January, they made a call to have the child in Manitoba County office. Children are important to the cabinet. They have fewer. They have a healthy child cabinet office. That is not a ministry, it is not a department, it is an office of the cabinet, which allows it to have extra paramilitary, paranormal powers. <laughs> yeah, so then, by January, they called and said, we got the money. Go ahead and start. So here's what, how they did it. Every member of the cabinet, as opposed to us, that's education's responsibility, that's social welfare, you know, that's workforce development. No, they said, look, we all, this is all our problems, so we're all going to chip in. So they went back into their burden closets, we're going to coin jars. Now, their coin jars, if you're a minister of cabinet, is bigger than yours and mine. So they all put in about sixty to $100,000, so we got about $2.3 million right away, and we were able to proceed. So they were starting to pack their bags in the um, spring of uh, 2011, and then they moved down to Newtown, Connecticut. Uh, that spring and then fall, we launched the entire thing in the province of Manitoba, and within one semester, we were able to reduce the mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders. Every category of them significantly in one semester. If Manitoba can do that, why can't we? Now, but it can't happen in Tucson or Arizona. Does anyone here remember a Peace Builders Violence Prevention Project in Tucson, Arizona? It was on television on KLD all the time. It would have been great. So you'd see on the newscast, it was six times, every newscast, KLD Channel 13 salutes these Peace Builders of the day. And being named, most French people are interested. Reynolds are interested. Five kids.
kids' names and their ages. Now, that was the largest single youth violence prevention study in the United States of America in the middle of the 1980s. It reached more than 90 schools in this community, and there was a randomized longitudinal trial nested inside of that community mobilization, which most people didn't know about. The CDC did in the U of A, and I most certainly know about it because I was the principal investigator in the event. Within 18 months, we were able, for the first time in the history of the United States, to reduce medically coded violent injuries to children. The CDC sent out an FET and went through all the nurses' office records, and we were able to show violent injuries were reduced substantially, and every form of nurses' office visits. Because when you're under perceived stress and threats, that changes your immune system. And where would the safest place in the entire school building be? The nurse's office. It also then changed uh, pro-social outcomes and anti-social outcomes. It also worked for the most seriously impaired and behaviorally disordered kids, regardless of whether or not they're We did it here. People called up and gave money. Mayor Miller called me up one day and says, Dennis, this is uh, Mayor Miller. How, how, how are you, George? He says, Dennis, could you use $150,000 to help support the East Coast? It's the first time any mayor, elected official in Tucson, Arizona, has ever called me and offered money. You know, normally it's them calling me to give them money. And some of you have had experts, too. So they got some money. People pitched up, church members, they taught Sunday school, church members stepped up. Other people stepped up. And we have it in all those schools. Okay. But this can't happen in the US today. Cannot happen today. So in 2010, the Institute of Medicine report issued, I'm sorry, and 2009, March, the Institute of Medicine issued a report on the prevention of mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders among young people. That was the first time a government agency of the United States or anywhere in the world said that mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders are preventable, including the most serious ones, including bipolar and schizoaffective disorder. Anybody see that on the news? like on 60 Minutes, or in Time Magazine, or Huffington Post, or New York Times? No. Didn't. I mean, if there were an announcement from the U of A that they cured a cancer, there would be a big announcement. So eventually, the feds then decided to act on that report, and they challenged us a year ago to implement this same strategy in three months to prove that it was possible to scale up quickly. So this was implemented, this little first grade strategy was implemented in eight diverse school districts across the United States that we could not choose, the federal government chose, and we were told there will be measures of the success of all of this, um, and we, there will be videos and interpretations of all of this, about how it works. Now, we don't have the long-term studies, but this was a demonstration of can it happen now in America. So we're going to show you some of the things. Yes, when Rachel Long, my coach, came to me, she 
did a data collection, a baseline, um, and she showed me how many splings I had. It was like 300 and something splings. And I was like, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> it was the first week that we implemented the uh, kernels. We saw the splings go you know, from 500 to 250. Each week after that, the teachers would introduce an additional kernel. So by the time we got to full implementation with the game, that same class was having nine slings total. All right, so give yourselves a pat on the back. Show each other some love. Okay. Once we introduced the cues and kernels to um, our first class, it was very evident that we saw a difference. Um, we've been collecting data once a week since we started the project. Within four weeks, we saw that number drop to maybe a third. Um, we are down below um, double digits now in all the classrooms. I think when you see it that way, and you see a real life experience of a teacher who's pulling her hair and looking like she just waiting for two o'clock to hit the bar to enjoying her role, I thought that was big. It started out as a, as a pilot with just six schools. And just recently we've expanded to 19 schools. And it's, um, it's catchy. Um, people are getting excited about it. Uh, they keep, what is that? And I want some of that. I have other teachers look around and ask me, what is that? What are they talking about? What's a spleen? And all of those kinds of things. So yes, it is very much so going viral in our school, in a good way. I'm a bilingual teacher, so um, teaching them that vocabulary, it wasn't only new to my students that were only Spanish speakers, but it was a new vocabulary for all of them. So, um, you know, using spleen, it wasn't only new to them, but it was new to all the kids. So it was easier for them to learn spleen, to learn packs, you know, and, and they became part of the community as well. This is my ninth year of teaching. This by far has been the most impactful thing I've used in the classroom. It's long lasting, um, it's structured, you have data to back up what you're doing. Now today when we do this, we're going to play our, another PAX game, our third game of the day. What would be some spleens? What would be a spleen? Carlos? Um, like, getting out of your seat. Okay. If you look at the beginning of the year, all the spleens that I was recording and compare them to now, you'll see that there's a gigantic decrease. Um, the length of time that kids can work independently since starting this game, we started at three minutes, we're up to 20 minutes now. It's just, it's made a huge difference. Because you don't know what's right or wrong, so, like, if you do something, you're not supposed to do these things. Like, can do that spleen for getting up more than one. We are going to play our past game as we're using the restroom and as we're getting to gym. So I want you to tell me what would be past behavior. Noah. Notice they are predicting. Walking, staying in that past line. Those are good past behaviors. Kelly. Can you to talk to the person behind you in the hallway? All right. I like that it works on the positive, that you look for their good behavior, you look for, or the behaviors you use to say, say you want more of. And so I focus, oh, I'd like to see that. And I like the fact that it doesn't focus on one student, but just generalizes, oh, I see a behavior that we shouldn't be doing right now. So let's see now, we must see less of that. So in the past game, they are monitoring their own behavior and they are controlling their own behavior and they're finding out what, how they're doing with that. Can I maintain this expected past behavior for how long?
So right now, everyone is a PAX learner. Your bodies are settled, like we said. Your voices are off and you're looking at the speaker. And our mystery PAX person is doing an outstanding job for you. And when I don't, and I'm spleening, what are my spleens and what behaviors do I need to change? And they're held accountable to that three times a day or more. And that accountability is missing. That leads them to become independent and in control of themselves. The self-regulation is a better predictor of first grade reading scores than phoneme awareness. And so if they don't have these, they're not gonna, if they don't have self-regulation, they're not going to do well in the common course average. Every student in my class passed the reading. Let me start there. They passed the reading bench one, and it was 73 questions. I had six to exceed, and the rest of them met. I had 20 kids in my classroom. That's ADHD that I said before, 504s, RTIs, uh, Everyone has to read. Okay, what I need for you to do is let me go up to Grady Wayne and see what we want again. Fuck. What constant? The more you play, the more time on task they are. It's the student that's stopping and thinking. It's the student making those conscious decisions. They now ask us to play PAX games because they like the feeling they get when they are playing and the rewards and just feeling that power and just feeling proud of themselves all the time. They notice when our classroom is too noisy and they'll ask us to play PAX games so we can quiet it down and get everyone settled again. We're now going to move into our lesson on the car deck. Listen carefully so that you know what you need to look and sound like as a PAX person transitioning. Let's see if you can get there by our count to 11. One. What would work? Playing the game is like some people who are doing the right like doing the right thing, then others are doing like not the right thing. Then after we started, everybody's been doing the right thing. The good behavior game has absolutely been embraced in this uh, at the school side of this community. It's something that we definitely never would have imagined that something as easy as playing a game in the classroom would create such great results. The data that talks about the reduction in suspensions, the reduction in expulsions, the reduction in the amount of students receiving mental health uh, therapy uh, is something that absolutely should be everyone's goal. The good behavior game, again, is something that we really didn't have to dedicate a whole lot of time to uh, for it to show the positive results. It just happened. I've seen this game played during an intense math um, lesson, and to see that many students, and we have large classes, to see that many students focus and have their eyes on the teacher, I can't wait to see their success. I know that we're going to have higher test scores. I know that we're going to have happier kids. I know that we're going to have happier parents because of this. Someone that is good at PACS. And also PACS theater is when you make people, other people better and you make yourself better. You also make the world better. Out of the mouths of the pigs. Okay. You just saw the teachers and kids talk about self-regulation in pure context of normal academic tasks. This was not an add-on. Now, this is the data that were collected by the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration to show the proximal effects. These are eight school districts, 186 teachers, and what you see is, for example, here, this school district, at baseline, in 15 minutes, there were almost 200 disturbing, disruptive, and inattentive behaviors in 15 minutes in those classrooms. When they introduced the things like the kernel, one of these, for transition, that reduces trauma responses and uh, has, helps the kids hear the instruction straight away and pay attention to shrinks down that time. You see that cuts typically around in half when you start to do those things. 
Then when they started to play the game, you see those numbers drop essentially three quarters under most cases. So here, this is the district that won the award for the highest baseline rates at 225. They were cut in half to about 125, then down to about 60. Disturbed. By the way, these folks are really excited. And you can see that pattern. Now, that's an example of what can happen very rapidly. We've actually done this in uh, several schools here in um, Tucson. That's been a sub rosa thing because no one will pay attention to it in any of the school districts. So somebody is uh, um, uh, Robert Smeeler, uh, combined schools. Anybody know where that is? That was on the bottom list. And we took, yes, sir. Did that District 2 not use the kernel? No, no they the just didn't get it pass? recorded. They didn't get it recorded. Oh, they're, that's just you know, stuff it. happens when you do science. Um, what's the acronym? Uh, it's not an acronym. It's a complete made up word. Oh, oh, okay. So, and this is actually part out of the science of all of this called relational frame theory. So if I tell the children you have four rules, for example, shut up, stop, still, and be quiet. <laughs> That's mostly what adults kind of say they want. But that isn't in service of higher learning and education. The other problem with that is that that's adult enforced, and the kids can't make a prediction. You know, people say, well, we have three or four or seven rules in a school. And I say, how many, how many ways can a kid be sent to the principal's office? <laughs> and people go, hundreds of ways. I said, there are more ways to be sent to the principal's office and ways to go to hell on the <laughs> So by using a language, asking the kids what they would see, hear, feel, and do more of in a wonderful classroom, in a wonderful school, in, in the whole world, they make a list. And that's packed. Peace, productivity, health, and happiness. That's they learned it then. And then split them over there and ask, what would you see, hear, feel, and do less of in a wonderful school, a wonderful classroom? And that list is very rapid by kids and adults. Those are called sleeves because there is no English word to describe all of those things. So by giving it a, a novel word, almost like a trade name, then all you have to do in any new circumstance is when the kids get on the bus, what would sleeves and packs be on the bus? They can form that judgment quickly self-monitoring and error detection circuitry builds up, which is why, but using a name that doesn't have any loading to it, emotional loading, helps the acquisition of the discriminations. Does that help answer the question? Okay. Uh, that's a whole deep level of science called relational frame theory, and we have some papers in brain behavioral science about that, uh, that are coming out. Um, so these are Observational data, so in the case there, it, I can't remember what the number of that school district is, but for whatever reason, they screwed up on their data collection for the occurrence. They did them, but just didn't record them. So how much does that cost? And remember all of those benefits that we outlined? Yeah, so this would cost, if we did this at a reasonable scale, in Arizona or even Pima County, the price of a really good box of copy paper per kid. Now we spend $128 just on the measles, mumps, very solid, and rubella vaccine. That's just for the buyout. That's not for the training, not for the marketing, not for the delivery of the shop. And mental, emotional, and behavioral disorders account for most of the morbidity and mortality of our current American population. 60 bucks per kid. If you do it small scale, it's basically double that price just because of the difficulties of scale issue. So, that suggests we could do something. We, I, we're a little short of time, and I don't want to keep you too much longer. But one of the things I'd like to do is, when we did this at Robert and Stanley, we took them from the bottom to performing plus. And do you know what the recognition was? Close to school. Okay? And 
and no one in the community, no one in the community asked the question, how did you go from the toilet bowl to good? Oh, this is some years, about five years ago, when we first started with Roberts, and then the two schools merged, and then it was well, the Roberts people did it, and then it took a while for the neighbor people because you know those the older kids won't do this thing, and I said no. All kids, this works with every age group. We have long-term data only for young children, but we know the reductions in disturbing and problematic behavior that everybody's whining, whining about will be affected even in New York City with 12th graders. It all depends on us as adults how we do this. But I walked in, for example, to a fourth grade classroom in Roberts, New York, learning eighth grade math, math from a substitute teacher. Okay. And every kid was participating and paying attention. Did any of this go to Sunnyside School District? No. So what everybody says is we don't have enough time, we don't have enough money, and that's somebody else's responsibility. Whose responsibility is this? All of ours. Yes, sir. About 20 years ago, there was a lot of push with this statement that it takes a community to raise a child, and I don't hear that anymore. Yeah, it's now viewed as a communist state. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and Hillary. Okay, and you all know that you know, she's on the other yeah, persuasion, yeah. she just hangs out with Bill. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, so. It's still, it was still a way to go. But the <laughs> truth is, ladies and gentlemen, it always was and always will be necessary for every single adult to participate in the rearing of children. But it's even worse than that. It's even more important than that for this very simple reason. In November 21, I got my Medicare. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. So, right now, the rate of old people to young children is one person over 65 to two kids. When I was a kid in 1948, and Social Security kicked in, a little earlier than that. But when my grandmother got Social Security, there were, for every one adult on Social Security, there were five children. How many of you, does anybody here have teenage children or teenage grandchildren? Okay. If you have those young people, by the time they reach retirement age, there will be one retired person to one child. Now, the truth is, it's going to be somebody, it was somebody else's kid downstairs in the cancer center that did the surgery on my hand that saved my life. It was somebody else's kid who recognized that what I had, unlike the other physician, said that it was osteoarthritis. Say WTF, since when do you get brown streaks down your finger and underneath your fingernail for osteoarthritis? You know, this is a very rare melanoma called some humble melanoma, an apple melanoma. Only happens pretty much to people with African American descent, which I had. My great grandfather was a free slave. So keep your finger and die, come off your finger and you'll live. Do it now. But there was somebody else's kids who saved my life. It will be somebody else's kids who like my body when I'm perhaps less convenient and debilitated. And so that bi-directional wealth transfer is unique. All species invest in their offspring, some more than others. For example, a turtle drops about 100 eggs and walks off into the ocean, and the seagulls have lunch. 
Elephants invest a lot, both to gestation and then in the care of their babies. Mammals and primates, of, mam of, of sea mammals and primates, invest a lot of energy in raising their children. Essentially, they're raising eternal, the children externally from the womb because they're born helpless because of the brain canal. Now, what's really interesting is that we are the only species that has bi-directional wealth transfer. We invest in our kids, but our kids, in turn, invest in us. How many of you have cared for a mother, a father, a relative, or a grandparent until they die, besides me? I had to do it for my mother, my father, and my brother. And my father, my husbands, dad, and mom. That doesn't happen in other species. Why is that? That goes back to the E word, evolution. You see it is that you, we accumulate knowledge over time to solve problems. Human tooling, human medicine, human other kinds of things. Okay. Those things represent decades of practice and knowledge. So when a bad thing happens, the young people who don't know have to go ask the older. So let me give you this example. Imagine a coral, a coral, a coral, a coral, a coral atoll in the South Pacific. A typhoon comes in levels all the vegetation and disturbs the atoll area so the fish are gone for a while. And there's the old, old ancient lady, 87 years old, very frail. And so all the young ones, the young adults come to her, and even the adolescents that come to her, and they say, Nana, Nana, the people are hungry, and there's nothing to drink. What shall we do, Nana? You remember the times past when our ancestors had this happen. Ah, yes. Go dig up the root of the yok yok plant. It tastes like yok, but will it give you water and keep you alive until the fish come back? That allows humans to survive over time on high directional wealth transfer. But right now, as you said, the adults no longer want to care for the kids. I, you know, I put my kids through school. I help my foster daughter, and I'm helping her children go to school. But it's probably not them are going to save my life. But it's these other kids. So we have to do the wealth transfer back and forth. So the question I have is, uh, in regard to uh, the uh, telephone survey uh, regarding the collective abuse, what, were you suggesting that the telephone uh, interviews or survey was more or less credible than the so-called legitimate studies? It was more credible. I'm just curious about that. Yeah, more credible, but actually an underestimate in and of its own self. So, but that's the best estimate of the underestimate. So to give you an example of what that means, the 2011 report for this state for uh, substantiated child maltreatment was 1,600 confirmed cases of child maltreatment and about another 1,100 that were probable. And that was out of 87,000 calls about it. But the data would suggest that there would be at least 98,000 total confirmable, substantiable physical maltreatment cases. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. cool, sorry. Um, you left me in real suspense here, I must say, because I'm still waiting to hear it. You told statistics at the beginning, and then there was a word, okay, we should do intervention, this will solve the problem. Then you get statistics. Mm -hmm. well, sorry. There, okay, fixed it, yeah. And then you came up with other words, packs and kernel, etc. Yeah. And then you gave statistics on there. What is PACS? What 
this kernel? How does it work? What is intervention? How does the miracle happen? We'll already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the short course. Okay. First, they make a vision, a list of what they see here, feel, and do more of, and questions. That's called PACS. Then they would, what they would see here, feel, and do less of in the classroom, that's called SLEEPS. That's the first activity. Because you have to have words to define what it is you're going to change, that the kids can understand. This is prior to everything. Yeah, the beginning. The beginning. Before. Then you put the kids on teams. The red team, the blue team, the yellow team, the green team. We're going to set the timer for a few, like a minute. And I'm going to observe packs and spleens during that one minute. So you keep raising your hand. Okay. And squirting out. Would that be packs or spleen if we were doing independent study? Spleen. So I would give you a spleen. Okay? For not for you, and I wouldn't call out your name. I just say that was a spleen for this team. You're sitting back there and you go. Nan, 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 who they got a spleen. What was that? Spleen. A spleen. <laughs> and Edith here goes, what was that? Packs. I saw some packs on the A team. So the timer range, you count up the spleens. If there are more than three, the team loses. So it's plus and minus. Plus and minus, but carefully constructed. Successful or not successful, right or wrong, that's all. Yeah, but it's, it's subtle because like everyone poops, everyone sleeps. So they're not wrong with the capital R, you know, big W. And that's important. So if the teams win, then you put, and any team or all teams can win. You get an activity prize called, you saw the giggling when they got all excited, let's see what Granny's fucking prizes are. They pull out a prize, it's a mystery prize. So it might be that they get 10 seconds to do wiggle worm on the floor. You blow the harmonic and they stop. That teaches self-regulation under conditions of excitement. And the other teaches self-regulation under conditions of learning and cooperation. Then you stretch out the time for longer and longer times. First graders can easily learn to play that game full on with full blown attention for 20 or 30 minutes, which is in excess of a college student's ability. <laughs> and this is it, and it works. And it works. And it prevents them from getting pregnant at the age 15. <laughs> and, uh, this is what it is. Okay. Yeah, but it only makes sense if you understand the neuroscience and the evolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. another thing uh, that will understand why it works. Right. But I want to know, first of all, what it is. That and then works. there's other things like, to, to, like using the cue here for transitions as opposed to yelling and screaming. So that's one of them. I think you were first. Yeah. On the list where you get, uh, you know, the list of the, the, the savings, like there will be so few or less yes. uh, drug. Uh, well, weren't a lot of these the same person would be in the uh, add up? Those, that is not a total of a number of people saved. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because there can, there can be overlap. Yeah. The, the people who have drug addiction often smoke yeah. and often have alcohol. So it's not the total, but it's a very large reduction in the total population. Yes. Where's a kernel? A kernel is the smallest unit of scientifically proven behavioral influence. It has to have independent peer-reviewed publications. May have randomized trials, but it may have a, um, what are called interrupted time series or applied behavior analysis studies. So this is a kernel. <laughs> Little sign or peace sign. You get the kid's eyes on you before you give the instruction. That reduces standard transition time from two to five minutes per transition time, about 10 to 20 seconds. Yes? But I do programs for the Colorado Historical Society, and, and I've noticed a lot of teachers, and immediately the kids count down from 10 to 1, and everybody has to shut up, and they do it themselves. Yes, now there's one slight, that's an example of the 
piece of it that works. The reason why we don't do the clapping <coughs> is... Oh, the teacher does that. I know, but why the, the teacher does the clapping? About one in four children in a class, in an elementary school classroom will have adverse childhood experiences. So at a, one of our training sessions, I asked the adults there, what does that sound like? And one of those adults happened to have a five-year-old child with her who had to come with her because preschool had been let out early. And immediately out of that boy's mouth was a slap. <coughs> really? So, you know, the entire room went. <gasps> So people don't think those things. That's why I'm a scientist. Well, no, I didn't fully understand that. My point is, how come nobody's ever told this teacher that? Uh, Any of these that I've seen do it. Yeah, it sort of works, so they don't know the subtlety. But, and they're not learning this in the departments or schools of education in America. They, uh, but right now, we've actually just finished a study. study. This is going back about 10 years, but I haven't done this for a while. They may have changed it by now. Yeah, well, no, it still happens. Yes, sir. I think your presentation is excellent for any rational person because, you know, anybody from the spectrum of a liberal to a libertarian appreciates the ROI and the way you set it up. But honestly, it's, a, it's been a failure in terms of being able to get decision makers to pr proceed with the next step. So, you have any low hanging fruit for us? Yes. Uh, it's actually. Um, I've been talking to several political people here in, in Tucson about all this problem, and uh, the response was, you have a Republican solution to a Democratic concern. <laughs> uh, and there's a bit of truth to that. So the economics of this made very clear sense to the most clear-headed Republicans. Now please know that I've worked for three Republicans, Bob Cole, Jerry Ford, and uh, Mr. Cheney and when he was Secretary of Defense. You have my sympathies. Yes. <laughs> Look, you know, I'm going into the office and I'm, I'm a GS-15 and I'm going in there as a conscientious objector, a liberal Democrat, and a game <coughs> for Darth Vader. <laughs> How did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, it's a very wonderful experience. But, there's a whole group of people still, you know, the Republican folks of old were very civic minded and very responsible citizens. And what we have to do is to create the space for them to act. And th this is beginning to happen. Our largest state that we're implementing all of this in is Ohio, which is a purplish, reddish state, and now the state of Oklahoma which is, um, <laughs> there might be one or two Democrats, well, in Norman, there will be some yep. Democrats, but um, it actually is, pardon? Born and raised. Yes, my family, my grandfather was, um, my great-grandfather homesteaded to Dewey County, so I did go to school there, but yeah, but it's interesting, so if you don't present it as a confrontational thing, but present it so that each party can hear how it meets their needs. And I have answers for every single right-wing objection. And, you, and I answer them, by the way, with scripture, which makes them. <laughs> yeah. So, you have authority. Yes. From up there. Right. So okay, let me give you one example. Okay, which is one that you can talk to people. What's the most famous quoted line in scripture about child rearing by the right wing people? Spare the rod. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Now, I taught Sunday school for 12 years, so I know something about this. So, what was the language that the ancient Hebrews spoke? Eric. What was their major profession? How did they make their living? They were shepherds. What were the tools that shepherds had? A staff. And what was the other one? A rod. So what did they use to the crook, the staff for? Guard the sheep. Guard the sheep, protect the sheep, guide the sheep, rescue the sheep, put the crook. Also, to use, since the staff was tall, they could also put their cloak over their head to protect themselves. 
themselves from the rain or inclement weather. What did they use the stick for, the rock? We hate that. Back on the wolves. Okay, so if they hit the sheep, the sheep are bad, they're eating something they're not supposed to. Whack, whack, whack. Okay, so you're eating something that's going to make your milk fat, or your meat taste fat. Now, the next, you know, there are no fences or barbed wire in ancient Hebrew, in Israel. So I whack the sheep and come back the next day. What are the sheep going to do when they see you? Run like hell. <laughs> and if they are in a position they can't run, they're going to freeze and quiver. Children do exactly the same thing. Some will even faint. Pardon? Some sheep will even faint. Yeah, they'll faint. That's right. So, God in Scripture didn't mean for us to scare our children to death. What did, he, what did the scriptural interpretation mean? Well, they didn't have bows and arrows. They didn't have guns. So what did they use the rod for? To protect their sheep from predators. Two-legged and four-legged predators. And the latter, the, the two-legged ones, were sometimes more common. <laughs> That's been a long history of that. And the word to spoil in the ancient Aramaic means to be laid to waste in an act of violence. So if you don't protect your children, they will be laid to waste by predators. I've had pastors just go. <laughs> Never thought about that. And I said, are we doing a good job protecting our children from predators today? No. So that's, you can bridge, not by denying, but engaging and using their own logic for things to embrace them. And then I ask questions like to a congressman or a representative, uh, how many of your constituents, you know, your contributors, might have a child or an adolescent or an adult child who has a mental or emotional behavioral problem? Two months. Okay. Only had one. Father Grace is wrong. I had no one in my family to have those problems. You lied. That man, he had a whole closet full of people. And he didn't want anybody to. But to bridge the conversation with the metaphor and ask them what it is that they want for their, and here's the other way that we ask people to do this. We've asked you to make a list of what you want to see here, what you want to see here, feel, and more of for your own children or your children of choice or your grandchildren. What do you not want to have? Everybody that makes a list, it's always the same list anywhere in the world. <laughs> okay? And then say, what do you want for your kids or your grandchildren? Friends. They start to make a list, a new list, in about 15 seconds into that. You see this gear is turning to people and you're up front. Oh, the same things. And what do you want? for your kids or grandkids, friends, friends. Why? Say that. Why? And the answer is, if the other kids don't have the good things and they have the bad things, they'll infect my children and my grandchildren. That's right. That's the way to conduct the logic and the connection. So we're all in this together. <coughs> raise our kids. But it's so logical. Not, why not everybody do it? Well, I'm one person, and I have to create a social... What we're trying to do is to create a social movement. So that's what we need. I think it's a lot easier to give a child some pills, and we have <laughs> corporations and drug companies that push it, and I have seen it done, and it's a crime, and it's done, it makes a child that is a 
just a little energetic, oh, he needs to be more convenient for the teacher or for the parent or something. So we try to control everything with drugs. And this is a problem. It's a big, 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 big problem today. I just said, you have a call, you said? Oh, sorry about that. I have to go and wash my hair. Okay. So now let me tell you, just as we close, we have to create a social movement on this. This has been done many times. And so we're going to propose that we do this in Pima County. It will be about $60 per first grade. We start with one thing that we can show demonstrable success. Once you show demonstrable success, then you can start to introduce other strategies that work. Now, the cost economics are pretty clear. So it would be about $750,000 to do this for all of our first graders, maybe a million uh, first graders in Tucson. Now, that same amount of money would only treat 208 children with methylphenidate and uh, collateral medications. But the experimental randomized control group studies for psychotropic drugs are way less effective than the prevention science that... Uh, it's a crime. You make them mentally sick for the rest of their lives. Yes, I agree. So, I need to shut off, but I do want to announce one thing. I'll stick around and answer questions. You can take my card and we'll see what we can do. But this gentleman saved my butt. So, I paid him $60 to give away uh, six CD ROMs to anybody who wants to come up and get them first. <laughs>